Hi, folks. This is Mark by Mark A. Foster, Ph.D. for the Institute for Dialectical Metarealism. I will talk in this uh, episode about right-wing libertarianism as right-wing authoritarianism, and then introduce uh, some examples, including family dynamics. I used to teach uh, marriage and family when I was still working as a professor. In fact, that was the first course I ever taught. And I taught it generally twice a semester for about four years. So I had quite a bit of experience in that course. I actually liked it. It was quite a popular course back in the early 1980s. For whatever reason, it is not that popular anymore. It is not taught as much as it was for some reason. Why? Have people lost interest in the family? Have families uh, suddenly become less dysfunctional, less problematic? Well, obviously not. But tides turn, priorities turn, and interests turn as well. But let's start with a general discussion of what I mean by right-wing libertarianism as right-wing authoritarianism. On first blush, it may seem as though those two concepts are opposite. I would argue that in reality, they are not. Here's why. The United States is both a right-wing libertarian and a right-wing authoritarian country. Why? Well, Frederick, Jack Frederick Jackson Turner a preeminent American historian from the 19th century, is one of the main people who came up with the so-called frontier hypothesis. His basic idea was that rugged individualism in the U.S. was a result of the frontier. When people moved westward in the U.S., they confronted numerous obstacles. Of course, among those obstacles were the indigenous inhabitants of the United States. Um, and many of those indigenous inhabitants were killed, whether through war or by the spread of disease, because many Native Americans, perhaps most, did not have immunities to the same kinds of diseases that the Europeans had. So when they came into contact with those Europeans, they often died or became severely ill. Entire tribes or nations were killed off or died off as a result of the spread of disease. But back to the subject. Rugged individualism. As the colonists moved westward, they had to cope with the elements and with the indigenous inhabitants. Sadly, many indigenous inhabitants, as I said, died or were killed. And that was because to a large extent, the colonists saw them as effectively subhuman. They did not regard them as worthy of attention on a human level. They were not humane toward them. And so using my own uh, vocabulary, I would argue that many of those colonists were not human beings, which to me is the same thing as saying they did not possess humanity. They were certainly homo sapiens sapiens, but human beings, definitely not, in my view, just as Christopher Columbus, for the same reason, was, in my view, not a human being. In fact, I would say he was subhuman, really, really subhuman in the kinds of things that he did to the Native Americans when he arrived on the shores of what became the United States of America. So that kind of libertarianism, which is basically an idea that people should be left free to do what they want. And um, that would include, in a modern context, 
as developed by Murray Rothbard, the founder of uh, right-wing libertarianism, as well as anarcho-capitalism in its modern forms, that would leave those people um, with the ability, because of their liberty, their alleged liberty, to become authoritarian. If you do not have constraints on human behavior, and right-wing libertarians generally oppose constraints, look, for example, at Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand was a miserable woman. She was very unhappy. And a lot of that unhappiness came to her, according to her friend, Bennett Cerf, the publisher, as a result of the Holocaust. Now, Ayn Rand was not from Germany. She was from Russia. So she was not directly affected by the Holocaust. In fact, her country fought against and eventually uh, triumphed over Germany, over the uh, Nazi regime. But nonetheless, uh, Ayn Rand, as a Jewish woman, saw the Holocaust and was really disenchanted as a result of that. She developed a very negative and selfish view. Her idea was that there is no God, or goddess for that matter, and that the best way that people can be is selfish. In fact, Ayn Rand regarded altruism as bad and selfishness as good. I saw her one time on the old Donahue show, Phil Donahue, which was a syndicated talk show, kind of the father of all other syndicated daytime talk shows. And um, when Phil Donahue was not willing to compete uh, with the kind of, uh, I guess, dirt that existed in many of the other daytime talk shows, he wanted to discuss mostly serious topics. His ratings went down and his show was discontinued. He came back a couple of times after that, I think once on CNBC and once on MSNBC. I believe both times uh, were with his co-host, Vladimir Posner, who was still a very popular journalist in modern Russia, and at that time was a popular journalist in the former Soviet Union. But nonetheless, um, Phil Donahue would ask Ayn Rand numerous questions, and people in the audience did too. And Rand was extraordinarily rude. She would attack people for very, very basic questions, like asking Ayn Rand about how she came to think the way that she did, which to me is a perfectly logical question. Why not ask her that? And she would yell at people. If you want to find that, Go to uh, YouTube right here, I guess, and uh, put Ayn Rand in quotes and then put Donahue's show in quotes. And you will find, I think, the two programs that Donahue did with Ayn Rand. One of them, I forget which one, discusses uh, those kinds of things where Rand was just really, really viscerally angry at people in Donahue's audience. I was actually amazed that Donahue invited her back, but I guess thinking about it again, uh, that show brought him high ratings, and um, so he had her back for that reason. But it was clear that Phil Donahue was not very pleased with Ayn Rand. For some reason, Bennett Cerf had a very different opinion of her, and he saw her as a very compassionate person, oddly enough, who had been hurt by the Holocaust, but that in reality, she was basically pretending to be evil. She was becoming the personification of Atlas Shrugged, in other words, but she was not really Atlas Shrugged. She was a much different person in reality. Whether that is true, I have no way of knowing. She was a true libertarian, a true libertarian in her own way. And yet, she was extraordinarily 
authoritarian. She had no constraints on her. And so she was free, in her mind, I guess, to behave in the most vile way imaginable. That is what I mean when I say that right-wing um, libertarianism and right-wing authoritarianism are essentially the same philosophy. There is really little or no difference between the two. When I have met people, and I've met many people, including students, who were right-wing libertarians, they were generally very authoritarian. For example, uh, I had one libertarian student in my class, right-wing libertarian student, who hated religion, as many right-wing libertarians do. Many left-wing libertarians uh, do as well, but left-wing libertarianism and right-wing libertarianism are historically unrelated to each other. Left-wing libertarianism began 100 years before Murray Rothbard started right-wing libertarianism. So the two philosophies really are not directly connected with one another, although they do share some common features. I wish that Murray Rothbard had not called his philosophy libertarianism, because in most of the world, when you say libertarianism, you mean communism, especially anarchist communism, but it could be Marxist communism too in some cases. And so when people are talking about libertarianism, right-wing libertarianism in the U.S., outside of the U.S., they often refer to it as American libertarianism to make a clear distinction between how they use it and how it is commonly used in the U.S. So generally, if I say libertarianism in the U.S., the assumption will be, unless I say left-wing libertarianism, that I am talking about right-wing libertarianism. I have had students argue with me, even, that there is no such thing as left-wing libertarianism. And I then proceeded to give a lecture on the subject showing why they were incorrect, regardless. So authoritarianism can be based or founded upon right-wing libertarianism. Because again, once a person has no barriers, once a person's uh, chains are cast off, once a person feels free to do as they like, to say whatever they want, then they are also free to be authoritarians. So even though libertarianism and authoritarianism may sound on first glance to be contradictory, in reality, I would say they are not contradictory at all. In fact, they correspond to one another and they harmonize very well with one another. One example, families, the American family. The American family, using a term common in psychology, tends to be rather dysfunctional. I personally don't like that term dysfunctional because as a sociologist, it brings back memories of structural functionalism, which is a theory that most modern day sociologists do not care much for. But nonetheless, I am willing to use it to a limited extent when talking about families. So if we think of a dysfunctional family, what are we talking about? I have firsthand experience in that regard. My family was very dysfunctional for a number of reasons. First, I am a diagnosed autistic. My father was diagnosed with autism late in his life, but not earlier. Why was that? Well, in my opinion, and I'm not a therapist, obviously, I'm a sociologist, but in my opinion, there are two basic types of so-called high-functioning autism, even though I really don't think I was exactly 
a high functioning autistic as a child. I would say I was a middle functioning autistic or a moderately functioning autistic. I certainly was not low functioning, but I was not exactly high functioning either, in my opinion. So we had myself and my father. I had OCD. My father did not. It was people with OCD, autistics with OCD, who generally had the greatest problem. And so I was committed to a state mental hospital for two and a half months and got approximately 12 ECTs, electroconvulsive therapies or electric shock treatments. My father, in spite of my demand that in order for me to continue treatment, my father would need to go to that same place to be evaluated as well, was found to be totally, quote unquote, normal. Well, my father was anything but normal. He was an abusive individual toward me. He treated me like crap. What I think happened was that my father, as an autistic, but not as someone with OCD, looked at me as a fellow autistic and someone with OCD as a foe, as a threat to himself. And so the autism in myself and the autism in my father put us into conflict when I came into my teens. As a child, a preteen child, for some reason, my father was always very nice to me. He always defended me. That changed for reasons that I'm not entirely sure of when I came into my teens. But in any event, it was a horrible experience. So I, as an autistic with OCD, was different than my father as an autistic without OCD. I think that that is a reasonable way to distinguish between what I think of personally as two different types of high-functioning autism. So we became the spectacle of the family, a true spectacle. We made the family dysfunctional. Um, we did. Now, we had help. My mother certainly helped. My, my sister did not. My sister was not really involved that much. Uh, she tried to stay away as much as possible. She was not really a part of the, the dysfunction. Although when my mother would go on her sprees of not talking to me for three, four months at a time, she would also not talk to my sister for reasons that I still do not understand. And yet my sister pleaded with our mother to, to apologize to her. Pleading for an apology is not pleading for an apology because one cannot plead for an apology. Apologies are obviously freely given. But my sister really wanted to have a good relationship with our mother. And so she was willing to go to that extent. In fact, when I said to my sister, um, well, she never apologized to me. My sister said, well, why don't you take mom's apology to me as an apology to you? And I said, well, Amy, I don't take mom's apology to you as an apology to you. So how can I take it as an apology to me? Now, ultimately, uh, in addition to my father with his autism, myself with autism, OCD, generalized anxiety disorder, and post-traumatic stress disorder, my sister with narcolepsy, what I call ADHD minus H because no hyperactivity. So basically just classic attention deficit disorder, no hyperactivity, um, as well as being 
uh, having borderline personality disorder. And my mother, who was never actually diagnosed with anything. So what I say about her is entirely my own opinion. But I think my mother clearly had OCD. And I think if my sister has uh, borderline personality disorder, my mother, who was very, very similar to my sister, I would even say a much stronger version of my sister, that she had uh, borderline personality disorder as well, very clearly. My mother would divide the world into angels and demons. That's how she saw everything. When I spoke with her brother over the phone one time, and we became friends late in, late in his life, late in his life, because early on we were not very friendly at all. I asked him, I said, was your sister always like that? Did she always treat people as either demons or angels? And he said, yes, she was exactly the same way when she was a little girl. I was not surprised. So whether that meant that she had borderline personality disorder as a kid, I have no idea. But it appears to me that at least she had some of the preconditions for it. And so with my mother in my home, watching my father and myself fight like cats and dogs all the time, and cats and dogs does not even cover it, the extreme abuse, including physical abuse, that my father subjected me to, I think my mother was simply fallen. She, she fell off the cliff. She literally fell off the cliff. And so although I, I try not to be angry at her, I try. It is a goal that I have because I feel like I have no right to be angry at her. I understand why she turned out the way that she did. And I blame mostly the confrontations on a constant basis between my father and myself. I'm still angry at her. I really am because I remember these things. My mother would promise me that the next time that my father would beat me, we would leave. There were many next times. And we never left. Ultimately, I confronted my mother and I asked her why. Her response was, well, if we left, how would we support ourselves? That was her response. I did not know then, I was a kid, how to respond to her. But if I knew what I know now, what I would have said to her is, well, when your son or daughter for that matter, although my sister was not beaten by my father, it was only me. When your son is being abused, including physically, by his father, the first question you ask is, how can I protect my son? Not how do I support the family? You worry about supporting the family later. But that never occurred to me. And I really have no right to blame my mother. I mean, my mother was um, was a victim, too. Um, she was constantly fighting with my father. It was never ending, never ending. She loved her husband, my father, really loved him. But whenever I would walk in the door, she was fighting. They were yelling back and forth. And I think that was a result of the fact that my father and myself were constantly fighting. And she basically came to my rescue, but only verbally, only verbally by yelling at him. And so yelling at my father, yelling at her husband became a habit. That's my opinion. And so she never stopped yelling at him. Did my father yell back? At my mother? No. Never. He would simply go into the bedroom 
his bedroom and closed the door. My mother and my father did not generally sleep in the same room. They slept in separate bedrooms. That was because my mother could not sleep with my father's snoring. I mean, I was upstairs and on the other side of the house. And even I would occasionally hear my father's snoring. And so I could understand, you know, why she could not deal with it. Uh, and so she didn't. She would sleep in another room, in the other bedroom, which we called a den. That is where she generally slept. And so it was a very difficult situation for all of us. We all had a really, really tough time living in that household. It is not something I would wish even on my possible enemy. A really, really difficult family. Now, do I know if my family was more dysfunctional than most or than the average, whatever average might be, dysfunctional family? No. How could I know that? I only lived in my family. But if I had to guess, and it's only a guess, I would say that my family was higher than the norm in terms of dysfunctionality. At least there was no sexual abuse. That's one thing I am grateful for. Neither my sister nor myself were ever sexually abused. My mother was also not sexually abused by her husband. So that is a good thing. I am grateful for that. But it does not erase all the problems. Now, was my family libertarian, right-wing libertarian? Not exactly. I mean, my parents were Democrats, members of the Democratic Party. They regarded themselves as what were called back then liberals. The term progressives was not commonly used back then. But I guess today they would say they were progressives of a sort, but not that progressive, but somewhat progressive. And um, But still, our family was very libertarian, but kind of unintentionally so, because there literally were no rules. My mother or my father would sometimes tell me, you cannot leave the house until you clean up your room. And I have always been a slob, a trait that I share with my sister. I still am a slob. I am a living mess. <laughs> and I seem to create messes wherever I go, physical messes anywhere I go. Um, I would simply laugh in my mother's face, and walk outside the house. Why? Because I knew that my mother was too cowardly to do anything about it. And she never did. She never did. There was that element of authoritarianism, especially from my father beating me up and my mother yelling at me and not talking with me for months at a time, or my sister for that matter. But um, nonetheless, um, you know, I turned out okay. I am a high-functioning autistic. I am still nonetheless autistic. I have cognitive problems. I have communication problems. They are much less than when I was a child. Most autistics, as we get older, our autism becomes less severe, and that has been true with me. It is also true with uh, several of my friends who are autistics as well. I know one person, but only one person, who is an autistic, who as she has aged, has become worse. Our autism has literally gotten worse because 
when both of us were younger, let's say roughly 33 years ago, both of us were academics. We are both retired professors. We would challenge each other on everything, and we loved it. That's what academics do. Challenge each other, because that's how you learn. In most circles, that kind of behavior would be seen as impolite, but not in academia. In academia, that kind of behavior is loved, admired, even yearned for. I would literally yearn to be challenged. And I feel bad because as a retired professor, I don't get challenged as much now as I did when I was working. Being challenged is what keeps you vital. So I will go into situations online, for example, where I can be challenged. But it's still not as much as I was, but nonetheless, I still managed to get challenged. It makes me question myself and consequently improve my thinking skills and sometimes modify my point of view. So, for example, this past June, when I went from Third Camp Trotskyism back to Maoism Third Worldism, that was a result of my challenging myself constantly, constantly. And I still do that. I still do that all the time. But for some reason, when I challenged this individual, she yelled at me. She yelled at me. Now, she has yelled at a lot of other people. I don't know why. I think it's a part of her autism. Uh, she has very little tolerance for anybody who goes against what she thinks is moral. I often don't agree with her, but somebody that she thinks is not doing the right thing. She will often treat them very badly, very in a very rude way. I mean, extraordinarily rude. Um, she is one of the rudest people I have ever known. But she was never rude to me until two weeks ago when she, when she yelled at me over the phone. And what that did in my mind that was it. That ends at our friendship because our friendship was based on challenging each other. That's what we both like to do. And somehow, for whatever reason, and I suspect it is because her autism has gotten worse, she has lost the ability to challenge or to accept challenges from others. So she has become very authoritarian too. Now, is she a right-wing libertarian? Maybe. Maybe. She is definitely not what I would call a progressive, although she might think of herself as being a progressive. I would call her a right-winger. Um, she was a very strong supporter, for example, of Joe Biden, who was one of the first Reagan Democrats meaning he was a Republican in Democrats' clothing, um, and she really supported Joe Biden. Her views on most issues are extremely conservative, which has always kind of surprised me, because generally professors don't have the kinds of views that she has. So I would call her, yes, a kind of a right-wing libertarian who has, with age also become right-wing authoritarian. Or maybe she has always been that way, but not to me. So perhaps with her, she has always been a mix of being a right-wing libertarian and a right-wing authoritarian. It is sad for me to see that in her. It always was. I never liked it because some of the people that she treated badly, that she saw as not living up to her standards, whatever they are. And I don't want to get more detailed because that might divulge potentially who she is to some people. But regardless, um, she was always like that to some people. Many of them were people that I regarded as my friends. 
two especially. One is still a close friend of mine. The other I consider to be a friend, although we really don't have any contact anymore for a variety of reasons. I wish we did. I would actually actually like to work with him academically. Uh, he is he is one of the most brilliant, if not the most brilliant person I have ever known in my entire life. I have enormous respect for him. We once presented papers at an academic conference together, and his paper was much better than mine. Much, much better. I did not really put much effort into my paper. I should have, but I was kind of lazy. I really didn't care, so my paper was kind of sloppy. My writing is much better now. I'm much more careful, and I think I do a better job, but this guy put a lot of effort into his paper. So his paper was really, really, I would say sublime, really sublime. Mine was not. I would like to have a friendship with him still, and I still consider him to be a friend, a good friend, although I think our friendship is in, to use a technical term, an occultation, meaning it's hidden for the time being. Maybe eventually our friendship will be restored. I hope that happens. I watch his videos. I'll put it in a very general sense that way. I won't say where those videos are, what platform, and I admire them. I look forward to them. I don't always agree with them, but some of them I strongly agree with. So it's a mix, and that's fine with me. So what? That's that's how you learn. You learn by having your views challenged. And this guy has always been a source of challenge for me. Either I have agreed with him, or when I have not, he has challenged me. But sadly, he too has become very authoritarian. And he too is essentially a right-wing libertarian. He has always been a right-wing libertarian since I have known him. Always. He adopted a philosophy. Some might call it a theology, which was arguably a right-wing libertarian philosophy or theology. And subsequently, he became extraordinarily authoritarian to the point where he lost almost all of his friends. As far as I know, I am the only exception. I might be wrong. Maybe there are others. But of the people that I knew, they are all gone from his life. They all went away. He treated me badly, but I did not reciprocate. I returned his behavior with kindness because I like him. I genuinely like him. So I, I didn't fake it. It was not phony. I really like the guy. So I, I was kind to him. And he saw that. And one time he wrote me and said, Mark, I have nothing against you. To me, that was the most, one of the most wonderful things anybody ever said to me, even though it seems kind of minimal, because he had something against almost everyone, but not against me. So that made me feel really good at the time. Again, I've gone a bit off on a tangent, but I don't think that much. <clears throat> My basic point is that right-wing libertarianism, although <clears throat> superficially um, might di different from right-wing authoritarianism, is again only superficially different when looked at on a more detailed level. Those differences are actually very slight. And um, it is very common, therefore, for libertarians like Ayn Rand to become very authoritarian. And so the United States, for example, historically a very libertarian, right-wing libertarian country, very, very right-wing libertarian, 
going back to what I said before, the frontier hypothesis of Frederick Jackson Turner. As people moved west, they became very rugged in order to survive. survive. Um, but in so doing, in becoming rugged, in becoming individualistic, they also became authoritarian. I mean, a true libertarian would not slaughter Native Americans, right? I mean, I think that's common knowledge, right? A, a true libertarian of any sort should not slaughter anybody. But, but you saw that with the colonists as they moved west. Really, really despicable behavior. So, again, to put it simply, right-wing libertarianism and right-wing authoritarianism are, in my view, two sides of the same coin. For the time being, this has been Mark by Mark A. Foster, Ph.D. for the Institute for Dialectical Metarealism. Have a pleasant day and an even better day tomorrow.